Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to David and Brian for putting together such a great uh, forum here. I think this is very exciting, um, quite apropos with the presidential debates going on, so um, it's nice, nicely timed. So I'm going to discuss robotic-assisted ventral hernia repair and argue that it is something we should always be uh, at least consider for our patients. These are my disclosures, none of which are germane to this discussion. Um, Laparoscopic ventral hernia was first described in 1993. We're all aware of, uh, you know, its prevalence in the surgical care of patients with ventral hernias. Um, Sentinel article in this um, in this uh, field is was published um, by Dr. Henniford in 2003, which again shows modest follow-up and excellent recurrence rates for uh, ventral hernia. Um, along with that we know that there's a low incidence of, like in most minimally invasive surgical procedures, a low incidence of, um, of complications. And we, you know, from that found that there are many advantages of laparoscopic repair, all of which we're familiar with. So decreased wound morbidity, complications, um, better pain control postoperatively, returning to work um, more quickly, and certainly um, acceptable recurrence rates as far as uh, ventral hernia repair uh, is concerned. Along the same time frame uh, was the development of component separation. And so component separation, originally described in 1990 by Dr. Ramirez, um, is another um, treatment algorithm in, or treatment option in our algorithm to treat ventral hernias. Um, this uh, paper published earlier this year, um, e published uh, just last month, showed 428 consecutive patients uh, with at least 12 months follow up in most of the patients um, and showed again that. In open ventral hernia repairs, we have a significant incidence of um, complications shown here. So surgical site events of 18%, um, wound morbidity mostly. Um, and you know, the question that I ask is, you know, why, why do we see this phenomenon in the repair of ventral hernias? Uh, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, and my bias is, you know, to perform most of these operations, if I can, through uh, minimally invasive techniques. And this is the one field in sort of minimally invasive surgery that we actually don't see that evolution. And I'm just going to, you know, leave you with that thought. At least I don't see that yet. We do know from the urologic uh, field that robot impact in prostatectomy is actually significant. And here we see that the tipping point for that was somewhere in late 2008. This is a large database study from the National Inpatient Sample that showed that in 2008, we finally eclipsed open prostatectomy as the optimum repair for um, the uh, removal of the prostate um, by robotic assistance. And my argument is that we're now going to start to see the pendulum swing from open repair of most component, uh, most ventral hernias to um, a robotic assisted or minimally invasive uh, tenant um, as far as ventral hernia repair. Which operation should we be doing? Well, that I th um, think is answered. Um, by some of these early studies that show fascial closure actually um, provides an optimal repair. Um, this study out of Baylor showed that there's an improved seroma rate, eventration rate, recurrence rate with um, the intraperitoneal uh, onlay mesh with fascial closure when compared in a retrospective manner to traditional IPOM. Um, you can see the graph there at the bottom. Um, all of which were statistically significant in this data. One of the largest studies published um, earlier this year um, using this technique showed over 1,300 uh, lapros laparoscopic ventral hernias with routine fascial closure. Um, an excellent follow-up, 83% um, uh, of the patients followed for over six years. And you can see here that 4.7% recurrence rate over that time frame is, is quite acceptable in this field. So with that information, we've had expert guideline development that re recommends suture repair of the midline, so recreation of the linea alba, which allows a better functional outcome. 
Um, my argument is that robotic assistance is certainly going to improve the adoption of this technique. So, um, you know, for your smaller uh, ventral hernias, you can see here in the video, um, simple suture closure. Um, but what do we do with the larger hernias? And that's where I think component separation is going to come into play in this field. So, minimally invasive or robotically assisted component separation is a challenging technical procedure. And here you can see the video um, playing from Conrad, who you'll be hearing from later, um, that shows some of the challenges with this procedure. Um, my argument is that the, although challenging and certainly early in its uh, development, again, using the tenets of minimally invasive surgery that you see listed, we certainly are going to see improvement in the postoperative outcomes. Um, most specifically, those complications that we see, all the wound morbidity associated with the open repair of the ventral hernia. I'll argue that we're simply at the beginning of this S-shaped diffusion curve, so technology adoption um, in the study sociologically of uh, technology diffusion um, is typically seen uh, in a S-shaped curve where we have, uh, at, this, at the current time, um, we are in the uh, lower left-hand corner here of the screen um, with a tipping point after which about 10 to 20 percent of the population, that being minimally invasive general surgeons or surgeons who do ventral hernia repair, are going to, you know, start adopting the robotic assistance for uh, the routine use of component separation. So in conclusion, um, I'm going to argue that primary fascial closure during laparoscopic ventral hernia decreases seroma rate, decreases eventration, wound complications, and recurrence rates. Robotic-assisted ventral hernia repair facilitates a better adoption of the primary fascial closure technique um, and will, like prostate surgery, allow for more surgeons to adopt minimally invasive surgical techniques for ventral hernia repair and should be used uh, for all minimally invasive ventral hernia repairs. Thank you. Thanks very much. Podium is yours, Dr. All right. Good morning. And I'd uh, also like to thank the moderators for giving me the opportunity to uh, present today. Uh, I'd like to also uh, congratulate my uh, co-debater for a, um, a good attempted presentation. And my points are very straightforward and actually very simple. Um, I do have uh, just one disclosure uh, and uh, educational research grant from Intuitive Surgical regarding uh, research on surgical ergonomics, which I did not hear presented today as a potential advantage for robotic ventral hernia. Uh, so the really three main points as to the disadvantages for robotic ventral hernias and why it should not be adopted as a routine technique. And these are uh, things that we all know just really kind of uh, uh, intuitively, not to uh, use a pun, uh, are disadvantages to robotic surgery. One is increased operative time, one is the increased cost, and really that there is no clinical advantage to date. And I think it's really very hard to argue against any of these, but, we'll, but I, I appreciate my debater's attempts to do so. Uh, so first, with regards to operative time, so uh, we all know that, uh, you know, the docking part of the robot does add time to the procedure. When you get facile with it, it's not a lot of time, but uh, when you start talking about robotic ventral hernias, then you add more and more components to it. One, we all know when we're doing a laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, we're often approaching it from multiple sides. You are putting ports on the right flank, you're putting ports on the left flank. When you're doing with, with the robot, it's no small feat to have to undock the robot from one side, move to the other side. This is a multi-quadrant surgery for a device that is not designed to be a multi-quadrant instrument. Even with the new XI robotic technology, uh, it is still limited with regard to its ability to do multi-quadrant surgery. So the docking and undocking adds additional time 
we talked about closing the primary defect, and we'll talk about the data behind this shortly, but if you do want to do that, that too is going to add uh, time to the procedure. This is not a uh, insignificant uh, piece. Uh, one of the arguments that uh, sometimes is made is, well, when I use the robot, I can avoid using tax. I'm just going to suture the mesh in place, or I'm going to suture the peritoneum closed. Uh, you know, from folks who do, you know, inguinal hernia repairs laparoscopically for a long, long time, this has always been the case. You can suture these things uh, down instead of using a tacker, but the reason that most uh, people use the tackers is because of its ease of use, its convenience, its speed, which is obviously important in a, in a surgical uh, arena. So if you do take now not just an inguinal hernia, but a large ventral defect, and you're going to sew that closed, or you're going to sew the mesh in, or you're going to sew the peritoneum in, that is going to add a lot more time to the procedure. These things add up um, as, terms, as part of operative time. What about the cost? We're, I'm not going to spend too much time on the cost today as uh, we're having a subsequent debate on that piece, but I'd just like to remind folks of some really striking figures. This is the, you know, the dual console SI system, over 2.2 US uh, million dollars. Uh, that's just the initial capital costs. Don't forget about the instruments and accessories, which have a lifespan of 10 uses per instrument, uh, which can cost 800 to $2,200 per case, depending on the number of types of instruments used as well as the annual service contract, which depending on the hospital can be upwards of $200,000 per year. The new XI system uh, has similar, similar costs as what's de described here. And in addition to the equipment costs, just like I mentioned in the previous slides, time is money. And so with the robotic ventral hernias, we're adding time. Well, some of the data, and there is very limited data, but the paucity of data that's presented does show that these procedures do take more time, on average 20 to 25 percent longer per procedure. So let's talk about the clinical evidence, or lack thereof. Uh, if you do a literature search, which we did in preparation for this debate, and you look at robotic ventral hernia, incisional hernia, TARS, umbilical hernia, and different combinations thereof, you will find eight studies since 2003. The robot has been available, FDA approved, for over 15 years now. Laparoscopic ventral hernias, as was presented, has been available for uh, over 15 years. So these two have been out there together. This is not something that has just kind of come out on the market. And why, why hasn't this, you know, it's kind of proof in the pudding. So. Uh, there have been eight studies. Five of them have been a proof of concept, basically just a feasibility, I can do this you know, safely kind of study. Two of the articles are review articles. And there has been one retrospective review published so far since 2003 on the use of robotics in ventral hernia repair. And let's take a look at that study. So this was an uh, article published last year in International Journal of Medical Robotics, Computer Assisted Surgery, looking at laparoscopic ventral hernia repair uh, with primary closure versus no primary closure of the defect, potential, highlight the word potential, benefits of the robotic technology. And what they did is they had, this was a retrospective review, they had 67 uh, patients in which a traditional laparoscopic ventral hernia was done, and they compared this with another 67 patients. This was not uh, prospective or randomized, but retrospective, uh, where they did laparoscopic ventral hernia repair using the robot, and in this group, they did a primary closure. What they did find, as mentioned, was that there were longer operative times, over about 20 minutes on average increased operative time using the robot, and importantly, there was no statistical significant difference in complications or recurrence rates at a median follow-up of 24 months. So again, you know, the argument is, well, if I use the robot, I can do something different than I do with the laparoscopic. I could close the primary defect. And what, what about that? And here again, the data is equivocal. One of the uh, largest kind of systematic reviews was done by Wynn and others in 2014. They looked at 11 studies and finding really a paucity of data in this regard. The studies were mostly level three and level four data. 
Um, only three of them directly compared laparoscopic to uh, closure to non-closure. And basically the, the summary of the article was that the data was inconclusive. One of the studies that was quoted of the three comparative studies was by uh, this group and they did a retrospective review of 128 patients. Um, no significant difference, although seroma rate was higher in the primary closure group, interestingly. And the bottom line is the current literature lacks randomized controlled trials examining the effectiveness of primary defect closure. Bottom line, it takes more time, costs more money, and there's really no clinical evidence right now to support its use. Thank you.